Okay, so hi, good evening everybody. Uh, it is absolutely super to be with you. I am Sarah Parrott and I am the current president of the British Association for Psychological Type, which we um, naturally call BAPT. And I'm completely delighted to uh, be talking with Richard Owen this evening, who I'll introduce in a, in a little moment. So just a, 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 a quick plug. Um, BAPT is running a absolutely outstandingly fantastic conference with the most incredible lineup of speakers and I'm honestly not exaggerating one iota. So the 15th of um, April through to the 18th of April, it's all virtual so it's online. Um, please go to the British Association of Psychological Types website to register for the conference. It costs £125 if you're a member or £150 if you're not a member. And there are, are four full days of starting at 12, one o'clock going through till seven, eight o'clock of the most outstanding lineup of speakers. So really something not to be missed. So I encourage you to sign up for that. So um, this evening we are in conversation with and it's slightly different this evening. The tables are turned, and Richard Owen, who is normally the converse, who is normally asking the questions, is this evening answering them. So uh, it's absolutely great to have you, Richard. Welcome. Hi, Sarah. It's great to be on the other side of the uh, conversation for a change. So thanks for hosting. Yeah, my pleasure. So just to let people know, you're a trustee of BACT. You're our treasurer, our trusty treasurer. Um, you're a qualified organisational psychologist and coach, qualified in a number of different both type and trait assessments. And your real area of speciality is depth typology, which is the approach and work of Dr. John Beebe. So we'll uh, obviously come on and hear a bit more about that. And you have taken a very integrative, integrative can't say it, approach to these theories and have developed your own model called personality parts. So just thinking about personality parts, you and I are really quite opposite, aren't we, Richard? Well, it's, it's interesting you say that. In, in some ways we are in, in our preferences. I think what's good about Jung's work and Beebe's work and at, at the bottom of it is kind of a, a systems model of the mind, like a dynamic model that on one level, we're actually all the same, you know? In the same way that like physically we're all broadly the same we've got the same set of organs and limbs and, and body parts as human beings you know our minds have also got roughly the same kind of structure as a system so on that level we're the same but in, in the way that there's some kind of polarities and, and preferences and configurations within that system i could say yes we've probably followed slightly different paths in our lives yeah indeed um, so there's a question that's come up in the in the chat. So Richard Owen is the person who I'm talking to, and I'm Sarah Parrott. Uh, I think that's the question that you're asking. I'm not sure if it's not. Then do please come back and ask again. So I would love to hear Richard um, how you first got involved with Jung's typology and type, and uh, what was first interesting to you, and your your story about it. Just going to, before I get onto that, I'm just going to quickly answer the question um, that was just typed, and that was the, the type of yourself, which is type preference as an ESFJ. Is that correct? As an, so it's just to elaborate on the previous statements we made. So your type preference is ESFJ. So that makes you an extroverted feeling type. It does. I'm an INTJ by preference, so that's that's uh, introverted intuitive type. So yeah, so there, there's a different lens on reality between extroverted feeling and introverted intuition, you know, as we prioritize them in, in our lives. So, you know, in that sense, you're, you're spending a lot of time looking at the, the social expectations and rules and norms and whether people are happy or um, what they need and caring for people. Is that how you kind of experience it? Uh, yes, it is, and 
um, being very interested in there being a harmonious environment and people people kind of joining in and everyone being included and feeling included and experiencing interactions and experiencing one another. Yes, yeah, so a social awareness of relationships and people's states and and you no, know, for me, you know, I spend most of my time daydreaming about abstract kind of ideas and philosophies and coming up with kind of little nuggets of insight that kind of pop up from that process of kind of drilling into the the the, the essence of things and, and pulling out implicit relationships is the stuff I love to do. Yeah, that's my my little favorite little place to retreat to. Um, so yeah, going on to the, the next question, which was about my background. How did I get in? How did I get to, to be here? How did it all start? It was interesting because I, I first studied chemistry, chemistry degree when I was younger. And then it was just something that kind of logically, like I, I just got into because it seemed the sensible option. I'd studied science and maths at school. I had careers advice, like sort of pointed me down that route. So I didn't really have any sense of what else would be better. So I went and did it, but it wasn't much fun. I didn't enjoy it. I started kind of really trying to figure out what actually was meaningful to me. And I spent quite a lot of time figuring that out. In the end, I, I kind of realized I loved music so much that I actually wanted to just throw myself into a music career that lasted like almost 15 years. Um, in all different aspects, like being a performing musician, a songwriter, recording engineer, a live sound engineer, band agent, tons of things. Um, you know, luckily I, I had sort of my, my auxiliary extroverted thinking was quite useful uh, function to put to use in organizing and making things happen. So that, that was a that was an interesting journey, but. I, you know, I've always been interested in understanding myself and other people as a curiosity. So I guess that naturally led, led me in towards psychology. I gradually sort of realized I'd sort of done my time with music and actually I started to develop a real passion for psychology. And it was the, originally the MBTI that actually got me even thinking about this stuff. It was just literally finding a, a book that my brother had left around um an introduction to type book and um it did start to make a lot of sense like reading into what introverted intuition is about and actually realizing about my kind of like just as i've just explained you know that this sort of place where I, my consciousness keeps getting drawn back to um this this kind of quiet mystical process that you know it is it's something that uh, nothing else I'd ever read really kind of really explained or described that reality. Okay, so um, that's something that was really describing your experience. Absolutely, yeah, and, that, and that's the level in which I, I think type is, is really supposed to be situated in experiential psychology. You know, it's like Jung's work was massively grounded in, in introspection, in uh, phenomenology, in exploring the mind mm -hmm. from within. So I think that is its natural place, yeah. Okay, so you picked up a book, Introduction to Type, and and started reading it, and that started a, a real fanned flames of interest and passion in you. What did you then do with that, Richard? Well, it was interesting just taking that as a starting point to, and type as a model to understand how I was just kind of disp disposed in a different way to, to processing things differently to other people that I knew well. You know, I think type starts at home. Like you really start to understand it when you look at your relationships with people you know really well, um, like your family. You know, I, I was the only person with an intuitive preference in my family that I grew up with. Uh, my parents probably that like Richard so yeah so it's, it's interesting it, it's it's like there's always a it explains why you know there was always a subtle awareness without any model to explain why 
that I just I was just different and I saw things I, I kind of approached things in a in a different way that was somehow difficult for others to kind of get a handle on. They were kind of coming at it from a different perspective and you know, what to me seemed like a kind of a natural in, sort of insight into something. They'd be like, where did that come from? Like, how, how did that, and they, and they couldn't make that same leap sometimes to the same point that I'd got to as naturally. Um, so it, some of it's quite subtle but over years and years of living with this stuff, you start to realize that it's, it's a, a really are crossed wires going on when you're coming at reality from different perspectives, preferentially, you know. So you grew up in a household with mm. three, uh, three clear senses and you were the only one within the intuitive function. Yes, yeah, so, well, so, you know, for them, in terms of like the eight function model, uh, mm. None of them had like a strong sort of consciousness in terms of introverted intuition. Okay. So sort of my that that perspective on things was something that I, I was really inhabiting, but really wasn't that present for them, you know, in in the same way. And an introverted sensing as, as as a perceiving function was the thing which dominated their sort of perception of things. It was about or as it probably is similarly for you, I think, you know, as an auxiliary, it's that um, established facts and, and data, things that kind of got a traceable sort of concrete source, things that you can, can, can grasp a bit more than the, the slightly more abstract ideas that I would have. Okay, so you start, so having, having read Introduction to Type, that was like, okay, so that gave some explanation to you in terms of, okay, I, you really, recognising that you really do come in at life from a completely different angle and perspective to, uh, to the people that you were living with and had, and had a real curiosity about what, but both how life was for you and understanding that in greater depth and also how how different life was for them and understanding that in greater depth yeah yeah so it starts to give you a real deeper understanding and, and hopefully a compassion for like what the world what reality is like what consciousness is like for other people yeah. how they really are kind of just focusing on different aspects of it mm. um they can you know we can all focus on all the different aspects and use all of the functions but you know, then I started to realize, you know, you know, what Jung would call attitude, like I'm not, and it doesn't mean like introversion, extroversion. I mean, his concepts of attitude, as I kind of wrote an article on for, for typeface recently, it, it's much broader than that. You know, it's, it's about that phenomenon, which is closer to what we call preference in, in MBTI terms. But it's, it's, you know, when you've got that different value for these different perspectives on reality, and some of them are, are great, and you think they're the, they're the way to do it, to do things. And then others are wrong or not acceptable, or you have other subtly different, as John Beebe's model is so useful for, understanding the subtly different um, kind of judgments or qu qualities with which we experience these, these funk functions. So we have, you know, especially the shadowy ones, we have, we have particular sometimes quite negative experiences of those functions and, and therefore project that those onto other people. Mm. And, and that causes all kinds of misunderstandings and, and in, especially in families, um, you know, that, that dynamic I, was, I talk about with my dad, um, who actually was the same dominant, uh, same type as you actually, um, ESFJ. So you know, an extroverted feeling type and in terms of, John Beebe's model, that, that kind of, there's a crossover there, if with the shadow, with what is my dominant or heroic function was his trickster function and vice versa. So, you know, I really got to see that casting of a kind of quality onto, like projection onto the other person of like trickster is, you know, it's, it's literally seeing somebody as like kind of, foolish or silly or ridiculous mm -hmm. and so we had a mutual two-way projection going on with me and my dad that you know 
what 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 for me was my sort of strength which was this this sort of intuitive insight to him was just a bit kind of silly and ridiculous and kind of like brush it off and like his extroverted feeling was just something I would mock and like make fun of and laugh at because he would over you know I, I kind of over egg it you know do impressions and things like that <laughs> but it, it it can have quite a, a sinister side to it mm. I realize you're doing these things you just kind of get sucked into them and, and that's the problem with the unconscious aspects of the mind is that we literally get swept away by them we get kind of gripped by them we we get go on sorry you've got another question so as, as you've kind of grown and developed in your understanding of the eight function model what difference did that then make in your relationship with your father i think it was a good thing i mean no he's, he's not he's not with us anymore um passed away in i think it was 2016 nearly five years ago so it was interesting that you know I had I'm not sure how long certainly over 10 years of being able to understand our relationship from a tight perspective and it did make a difference you know I, I really did start to appreciate extroverted feeling in a different way I did I did value it you know and actually the model of just understanding it as just a different um lens on reality a different mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. actually just it, it sort of it helped me to kind of break that kind of projection of it you know mm -hmm. and, and stop that kind of not not too healthy relationship that we had, had at times so in that sense it was very powerful so by the time he, he actually just before he died you know i'd say it's kind of made peace with quite a lot of that stuff yeah. um which is great you know i think it's a good thing it's a very therapeutic thing to yeah. to have that you know with your family yeah yeah very much so so um you you've talked to that's great to hear that they actually made a real kind of practical difference as an esfj good to hear it made a really <laughs> practical difference to you richard <laughs> yeah in terms of your relationship with your dad of course yeah yeah so it's, it's, it's wonderful yeah so like you, you can see like just how impactful it can be in in a real life situation mm -hmm. so you talk about the eight function model and you've you've uh, sat at um uh john Beebe's feet and kind of learnt from him and and worked with him and worked with his material and and i know that he is um he's very complimentary about about what you have subsequently kind of gone on and done with the eight function model so if you were to be presenting that um in a really as simplistic a way as possible to make it accessible so people would think do you know what that is interesting and i'd like to find out a bit more about that and i could maybe use that how might you present john Beebe's eight function model well, in a sense, that's kind of what I'm trying to do with personality parts, you okay. know, to, to, a, to a large degree, you know, it's, it's based on baby's model as he created it, but it's a lot of it is around reinterpreting and realigning it from a different perspective, because, you know, for his model it would be the, the eight function, eight archetype model. Well, you know, to start off to even understand what that means, you have to understand what functions and archetypes are. So there's different levels. Like I'm trying to, like by personality parts, it 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 starts off from the premise that we have multiple different parts or aspects of ourselves. And experientially, basically pretty much everybody knows what you mean by that. It's something colloquially we, we talk about. You know, oh part of me is this, part of me is that, you know, or oh, there's a part of them that I really don't like. You know, we, we know that, you know, even though there's not a brick wall around these parts we, we know that qualitatively there's something distinct about them mm. you know and, and even you know as dramatic as you know things like Jekyll and Hyde and things like that you know it just shows like the, the different states that people can be in 
as recognizable parts. Yeah. Um, it's something that everybody hopefully is aware of in the world. And it's mm -hmm. such a wacky idea. There's a resistance to it for, in some ways because it's, it's got a slight pathological sort of tinge to it in, in some people's minds. You know, the idea of, I guess, if you think about like multiple personality disorder, as it was called, for instance, yes. you know, that's like a kind of more pathological sort of splitting. But the point is like the reality of, of knowing people in depth in everyday life shows us just how much we can recognize different aspects that are, that are different enough to be like little sub personalities, like different aspects of, of that person. So that's a good starting point, you know, and, and Jung implicitly and to a degree explicitly, like kind of talked about the same thing, you know, complexes, um, the, the archetypes as, as they're called in John Beebe's model, you know, the, the full term is archetypal complex. And a complex in Jung's terms, you know, is like basically a, a, a pretty much autonomous aspects of the, of the mind or psyche. So it, it's, it's something that kind of, as we know through grip experiences and things like literally comes along and hijacks us and, and takes us over. Mm -hmm. Often without us even being aware, we slip in and out of these kind of different states. There's still a seat, there's still kind of a narrative of who we are, of, of us as a, as a person that ties all this stuff together, but often we're not even aware of when we're getting gripped. And that's the first stage is awareness. What, what do you mean by getting gripped? It's when we're getting, when we're, when we're going into one of these other parts, mm -hmm. qualitatively different modes or states. Mm -hmm. And it's like we're not intentionally choosing that. It's like a different aspect of ourselves takes over, you know, without us willing it to. Mm -hmm. and like in a sense of like literally reacting or getting triggered by something. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that, get that triggering thing. Yeah, so thinking about your model that you're calling personality parts and kind of explaining it like that, where do you see people best being able to use it, Richard? So I think the most powerful area is in personal or even work relationships. Mm -hmm. It's because to a certain degree, we, we, we hide different parts of ourselves. There's, there's kind of a social veneer that, that when you first meet somebody, you know, there's, a, there's a certain reservation by which they present you with their, their kind of persona, their, 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 their public face. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it can take quite a long time to really start to see these other parts coming out. Once, the, once the, that kind of relaxes <laughs> and you start to see people flipping in and out of different modes, different states, and start to recognize them as repeating things that like, that like uh, you know, over time they become distinct parts of that person and you know when they've returned and someone's kind of gone into that particular one or, diff or, or another one. Um, in the relationship, it's, it's only after that time in a deeper relationship that you really start to get to know this model and this stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, so it takes living with somebody, working with somebody, spending enough time and with enough depth of relationship so that it, it kind of, you get past the honeymoon period, <laughs> so to speak, and it's all there <laughs> and it's all coming out. And, you, you know, it can be quite confusing and, and bizarre for people to, mm -hmm. to experience that, you know, well, this isn't like the person that I thought I knew. <laughs> actually, there's multiple different like, sub-personalities that I'm actually dealing with in, in one single human being. So that's where it's powerful is, is in actually having a, a map or a starting point mm -hmm. than that confusing complexity of relationships. So I um, have the privilege of having met your very lovely wife, Laura. So how useful is this model of personality parts with 
with your and Laura's relationship? How do you use it, Richard? Yeah, so I've been married now for a few years. Um, How many years? So since 2017, when we got married. And we've been together for just over seven years. So or almost seven years. So it's basically, you know, and we've had, we've had a child together. We're having another one, you know, I mean, we've been through all kinds of different things together, you know, so we've seen all the different sides of each other. Um, and, you know, like it's a, it's a real life relationship. So it's, it's, it's got its ups and downs, not all sides, not all parts of us are particularly pleasant, you know, we trigger each other in different ways. Um, it's, it's been an, like, you know, the most amazing model to just to watch what happens, just to watch everyday experiences. It's the stuff that is hidden in daily life, you know, in the most main, mundane situations, when the kind of interactions happen that you kind of react to something that somebody said or done, and you know you're getting triggers, and you start to realize that in the moment, that's that, what did I just do? What, what was that? Like, and another, another week, it happens again, and it comes back. And, so it's been amazingly useful actually as a couple to know con to, to consciously know about this model and to then think about it and go well what was that you know oh that was my critical parent you know and and we've got then you've got a name for a thing you, you can really start to work with something once it's got a name once it's 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 yeah. got an entity yeah. um and it's not a quick fix because you know this stuff the whole point of the unconscious is that it's it's not easily controllable it's 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 something that and actually the more we try to repress it the more it, it kind of pushes back and it is a complication um so you know each of us we we've both got therapists that we go to see i've got a Jungian analyst that i go to see I, I i look at my dreams i write my dreams down and i go and analyze them and and you know, a lot of sometimes the themes of things that have come up in little reactions or arguments between me and my wife, you know, it's pointing to something which for me is like a deeper kind of um, some aspect of polarity that is kind of trying to resolve itself in my mind as a system, just trying to work itself out, trying to develop. Um, and it provides the material you know, when these things, when, when you react to these things and, you, and, you, and then you're actually aware of it and then you bring it to awareness and you start so exploring it, it brings the material to, to start to understand of just in what ways we're one-sided and what, what, the, what the other side is that's actually trying to come out into our mm -hmm. process. You used a lovely expression uh, earlier. You talked about having nuggets of insight. So what's your most recent nugget of insight into the your own polarities, your own development, your own INTJ-ness? <laughs> well, yeah, let me have to think about that. So it's interesting because I just had a, like a, a session this morning. Um, I was looking at. Okay, yeah, so I'll tell you about this. So I guess this is a recurring thing, especially for any introverted intuitive type, you know, the greatest sort of spine of the personality polarity, as baby would, um, baby would call it the spine. That for me is the introverted intuition, extroverted sensing dimension. So it's always like gonna be an ongoing thing, like me and the physical world, you know, we've not always been best buddies, and to a degree, I've kind of blanked it out, especially when I was younger. I sort of seriously, you would just live in. Well, when I was a, when I was at like a, say sort of eighteen or like, like a, a university first time around, you know, I remember examples of of me kind of bounding down the roads to lectures in the snow in a t-shirt. It wasn't just because I came from Newcastle; it was just because I was also like. That's what it is. <laughs> like I was literally, you know, I was just blanking out the physical sense of the physical world. It just, 
yes, it was cold, but I, I was off in my own head. Like I was just, I was bounding down the road and people that I knew might, might go past on the other side of the road. And they'd be, be like, hey, Richard, how's it going? And they'd be waving at me and shouting and I wouldn't even notice them sometimes. I'd be completely oblivious. So like, you know, I, that, that's the degree of like not being present yeah. in the real world. Um, so that's, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Yeah. And interestingly, you've said um, that uh, you and Laura have a daughter. So how old is Yasmin? Yasmin is um, two and a bit half now. So what, how do you see her personality and her personality parts? How do you see that kind of developing? Oh, goodness. Well, it's a really interesting question. Um, you know, it'd be, it'd be interesting because anything at this point, you know, I'm just observing and, and like, seeing things happen and, and you know she, she's quite verbal so she does talk a lot which is useful because it starts to see definitely different parts of it definitely different sides coming out you know even at two years old it's it's incredible um you know my my and i'll be able to kind of understand better mm. gets older and i can talk to her about her own experience but you know from what i can see is that i think she inhabits introverted sensing quite a lot um why do you say that what she's she's very drawn like her, her her memory her concrete memory is is just great it's amazing you know and and my wife who's who's the opposite an introvert extroverted intuitive you know often laughs because because she like jasmine can remember things better than her she's just on the ball like she Two and a half. <laughs> I, I take her i take her around the supermarket and i'm like can you remember what we need to buy and she'd be like She'll tell us what we need to buy. She remembers what we talked about and what food we've, we're missing and like things like that. So she remembers things like, and if there's a puzzle, she she will, you know, the puzzle, you know, the puzzles where you um you have to match the the shapes into the holes and things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. puzzle. Yeah. Like if she's seen the puzzle, like she just knows where they go. Like she's photographed it in her head. She knows, she knows where the things go. It's not, she, she's not doing what I might do, which is like intuitively working out the shapes and, and matching them in, in my head in some kind of geometric way. She's just remembering where the thing was when she saw it as a complete puzzle. So it's, an, it's a remarkable kind of concrete, tangible memory. And the extroverted feeling is there. You know, she, she, she good parents me on my extroverted feeling. You know, if, I, if I'm talking in, in, a, in a kind of, in a, in a mean voice, I'm getting annoyed. Like, you know, she'll, she'll, she'll talk, she'll tell me off for it. <laughs> in a kind of, in a kind of, kind of a not, not harsh way, but, you know, like stop talking. She'll like say, say, stop talking or something like that, you know? And then there's, then there's the, the introverted thinking, which is like this little cheeky, little child function, little puer thing, which basically puella that, that plays little games with words and rhymes and things and definitions and, and calls things by different names and stuff like that in a kind of playful way. So really, yeah. That's wonderful. That's wonderful that you're you're able to uh, kind of identify uh, that at, at, you know, between two and three. It's uh, quite something actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's just amazing that these Kind of thing these parts of us are, are there even from such a young age absolutely yeah. and she's not you know she, she's not she doesn't really have the ability to to deliberately do any of this stuff it's just the mind playing out yes yeah. the thing. wonderful so you're talking um you're talking at the conference richard you have a keynote and in fact you are opening the conference yeah keynote so what is it you're going to be talking about? Um, so actually this conference talk, because it's the centenary of Jung's original psychological types or psychology type and or whatever you call it in German, it was, you know, my, my idea was to, to review some of the misunderstandings that have arisen. Because I spent a couple of years reading psychological types 
I read it a couple. Uh, you know, I, I read it. Read it twice. Um, and it's so dense and so complex and not it's not easy to read that. It, and it, it's it's open to a lot of misinterpretation. Um, I'm trying to get my own handle on it, but I think you know some of the ways it's been interpreted, including by MBTI along the way, has been not so helpful to understanding Jung's intentions originally. I think you know it's it's it's. I'm not saying it's bad. It's you know it's, it's done a great job of bringing something to people that might have just otherwise been lost in, in an obscure book on a dusty shelf. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. But, and it's great, but you know, when you go back to that dusty book, you start to realize, oh, it's part of a wider psychodynamic model, mm. which had so much to it, um, that we've taken a lot of it out of context now. Um, and there's various ways, I think it's, it's slightly been, you know, there's misunderstandings which have led to models now that slightly confuse that don't work as well as they could they slightly confuse things a bit you know so i think i'm trying to look at some of those things also looking at some of the ways which um critics of misunderstood type like whether it be mbti or, or jung's work yeah. i think there's a lot of misunderstanding because it's such a different paradigm for looking at personality compared to trait models, which is something I've also studied quite a lot because I did my MSc and I did my dissertation on big five facets. Mm -hmm. um, and I've done a lot of different psychometric training. So having an understanding of how trait models see personality and how they, the assumptions that are built into it and the mm -hmm. perspectives it's taken, just how different that is to Jung's world as a phenomenal phenomenologist, as a, as a, as a psychotherapist. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, I think there's something in what Jung was doing that has got a bit lost and is it, and that is shame for psychology. And there's actually in some ways like, you know, actually negativity and reactions against these different perspectives on personality that we're now seeing playing out again and again in, in, in all the sort of critics, criticisms and things. Mm. But I think there's a deeper sort of philosophical angle on what exactly it is that some people dislike about type. It, it goes really back to like, well, how do we look at what is personality and, and what is the mind and what, what <laughs> how are we even assessing it? So that's the kind of level I'm going to with it. You know, some, some sort of philosophical differences. I'll be looking at some of the misunderstandings on lots of different sides and, and trying to pull together a, a kind of narrative that you know, to some degree puts forward some of my own interpretations. I'm not saying I've, you know, I've got the only correct understanding of Jung's work, um, but it's probably a bit different to some other people's. And I think I'm trying to help um, open people's minds to, to sort of going back and having another look at the way we assume things through a tight lens. Mm. Okay. And would you be encouraging people to um, maybe have a conversation with you about in particular your personality parts model? How, how, how is that kind of fitting into the bigger picture for you, Richard? Yes, yeah, so I mean, it's, it's it's always an ongoing development. I think I'll be developing this for the rest of my life, you know, as a as a, as a thing. And I've you know started to do some sort of research, some focus groups, and things. Last year, I went through all of the different NT and NF types, and we did some quite in depth sessions, looking the parts of themselves to, via this model and getting some real insights into what those parts are like for them and for the people around them. So now, I've, well, it's a bit difficult this year with having another baby coming, but certainly I'll be going through the sensing types and we're doing focus groups. So be interested to hear from any sensing types that want to 
explore it as part of the research as a focus groups. Um, and you know, in terms of my, my own work, hopefully I'll be get back to doing some in-person workshops because I was running some in Brighton where I live and also in London before. Okay. I, I'll, I'll be doing some more online ones coming up as well. Um, what do they consist of, Richard? Are they half a day, a day? How, how, do, the, how do your workshops work? So I was tending to do weekend workshops, so over a couple of days. Because okay. uh, it takes time to really go into these sort of models. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd have quite a small group of, like, say, up to six people. And it gives everyone enough time to have a lot of input and time and, and individual time. Mm. And then you know, first of all, it's about like well, verifying like what are someone's sort of type preferences, what's their sort of conscious orientation. And then using, going through the whole like eight parts of, of the model mm -hmm. and trying to understand sort of theoretically and then experientially what they're like, you know, okay. really trying to dig into what it actually looks like in their life and their experience. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a, a, a sort of an immersion introductory course for getting to know the different parts of yourself and then you know applying them in relationships so that's mm, okay yeah you know, we'll, we'll use that as a, it's a relationships as examples but I, I love working with couples and I love working with people mm. in any kind of close relationship relationship whether it's a family or in a working context mm -hmm. so I'm interested in talking to people who want coaching who, who are and it's probably happening a lot in lockdown, you know, people who are finding they're in relationships and there's, you know, issues arising like part, parts of themselves and, and their partners or their family who are reacting and they're playing out these same patterns again and again. Mm. And they want to know, to have some insight on, into it. And, and, you know, insight is the first, and awareness is the first step in, in making a change. Yes. So it, I'd like to I'd like, so I'd like to if anyone wants to to have coaching on and using this sort of model then again it's another thing to get in touch about okay and how would they how would people do that richard so there's personalityparts.com um there's a form on there so if anyone wants to uh, send me a message you can use that lovely okay so um it's always fascinating talking to you richard <laughs> <laughs> I've and I've I have to say I've enjoyed it. I really have, and uh, really look forward to uh, to hearing what you've got to say uh, at the conference as well, and your continued kind of development in in the work of type. And um, just it'll be interesting to see where personality parts kind of comes to with it all. Um, mm. So thank you very much indeed, Richard, for your time and. Uh, and what you've shared with us. Oh, thanks for hosting. Okay, take care. Speak soon. All right. Bye bye.